Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem and welcome Ali Blake. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars. On the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's regular The bombs bursting That our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave Or the last Now stay on your feet and give it up for the Preservation All-Stars.
welcome everybody. In case you didn't know it, we're right in the midst of Mardi Gras season. One good clue is a lot of traffic. That's the first clue you get. But we're gonna do one of the great songs from Professor Longhair. This is called Go to New Orleans, Go to the Mardi Gras.
St. Claude and Dumay. Come on, shake what your mama gave you. Come on, y'all, yeah. You will see that Zulu king down on St. Claude and Dumay. And if you stand right there, somebody show you the Zulu queen. Please welcome Jennifer Lawrence. Hello. hello, New Orleans. And hello to everybody at home, wherever that is. Thank you, Preservation All-Stars. Though they're gone. Um, anyway, welcome to Unrigged Live. I'm Jennifer Lawrence. I'll be your MC for the night. the board of directors of Represent Us, and I'm so excited to be here with you at this amazing event. Now, I have a hunch that we're all here because we believe that our democracy could use some work, because we all believe that our government that we pay for with our taxes should work for us. So many of us have come from so many places from across the country from pol across political, uh, hang on, wait a minute. Everybody was so excited. From across the political spectrum to be here tonight. We may all have different reasons for being here, and I guess I'll tell you mine, because we're, you know, we're here. Um, I was born the first girl in my family in 50 years. I was a goddamn miracle. <laughs> to two of the kindest, most genuine brothers any girl could ever hope for, except for a few tiny flecks and moments of pure evil. <laughs> Growing up, we fought about everything except that mom was annoying. We were very different then, and even today, our political and spiritual beliefs are completely different. But we never stopped loving each other or rooting for each other. We respect each other, and we know that as a united front, there is nothing that we cannot conquer, even mom at Christmas or especially at a wedding. So let my family be an example that we do not have to pick sides. We are experiencing the same thing in this country right now, and it's time to come together. Across ideologies, across parties, it's time to unite to fix our democracy. Because regardless of where our politics fall, at the grassroots, the American people don't deserve to pay taxes to a system that is rigged against them. Fuck that. I am so proud to be on the stage tonight, and I'm humbled to be fighting alongside you. Thank you. We have an amazing lineup for you tonight. Insight, inspiration, comedy, and the first ever Courage Awards for fearless people who put it on the line to unrig the system. Our first speaker is the co-founder and director of Represent Us. Please welcome Josh Silver.
Thank you all so much. How do I follow that? It's awful. All right, thank, first, thank you all for being here, for taking the time, for spending your precious money and, and being here for this important thing. I wanna answer a question tonight, which is kind of obvious, which is why? Why are we here? I think Larry Lessig put it really well. Nobody really wants to have to save democracy. Uh, but the reality is, is that we're here because we're experiencing system failure. Um, you know that more than most people. Uh, it's beyond just the kindergarten factor that we see in politics every day, which is completely mind-numbing. But when you look under the hood at the problem with our democracy, it really becomes more scary. The Economist magazine, which every year looks at the world's democracies, and a year ago downgraded the United States for the first time ever from a full democracy to a partial democracy. Only 19 nations remain. And more recently, a couple of weeks ago, from the Freedom in the World uh, Index that shows that in the past year, US democracy had the sharpest decline in 40 years. So we're here to fix this, right? We're here for, to find winning solutions and to win them, recognizing that it's been 44 years since there's been major sweeping reform to the rigged system. Now, there's been important victories, McCain, Feingold, many other victories that people in this room have led. So let's have a round of applause for the people in this room who have done that. Thank you. But sadly, too often it's one step forward, two, uh, two steps back, and the reality, if we're being honest with ourselves, it is not enough. What we have done in the last 40 years is not enough, and we are tired of fighting for scraps. We need solutions, so we are here to find them. We are here to question our assumptions. We're here to innovate. We're here to change the play. We are here to do better. I want to suggest three ways, and not a complete list, <laughs> had to put that in, that we can be better. Number one, we need to build a bigger tent. A bigger tent, thank you. Now, this is a math issue, people. When Gallup asks the American people, how do you self-identify? Over the last 24 years, none of these numbers have moved more than six points. 25% liberal, 34% moderate, 36% conservative. None of those blocks are going to win and beat the massive opposition we face alone. The good news is this truly is not a partisan issue. This does not break down left-right. This issue, more than any other, breaks down the people in power against the people without power. And the reality that often is not said, I've been advocating to unrig the system in many red states with Republicans in power fighting me viciously against efforts to reform the system while Democrats cheer me on. And I've been in many blue states where the Democrats are in power, they often do it more quietly, but often oppose efforts to fix the rigged system just as aggressively while the Republicans cheer me on. It's reality because those in power want to keep the system the way it is so they keep in power. So in reality, this issue is truly post-partisan because it's post-partisan. It's not bipartisan because this duopoly is not working. It's gridlocked, it's entrenched, it kills all the issues we care about. It breaks the promise of our democracy. Democracy, duopoly, doesn't work in commerce and it doesn't work in politics. So, the reality is when you look at the American people, how they're registered to vote, this is stunning. 46% of American voters are independents. Look at that chart. 46%, almost 50%. Just 27% are Democrats. 25% are Republicans, and majorities of the members of the parties aren't even currently happy with the party. So when we build this bigger tent, we need to embrace this idea that the people who disagree with us politically, they love their children just like we do. They love their communities. They love their country. They have the same or similar fears about their future. So what we need to do, and Martin Luther King has been quoted, thankfully, many times this weekend, we need to really, as a movement, embrace his words. Love is the only force 
capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. I'm gonna read it. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. We need to hold this as a movement. We need to be bigger than the partisanship and the vitriol and the hate. We need to love. Number two, solutions. You notice the S on the end. Let this weekend be the end of this reform will fix everything. Not happening. No, no. When you look at this, you see that indeed, ethics and accountability, money in politics, fair districts, voting in elections, technical innovations, all of these are needed. Complex solutions to, yes, sorry, a complex problem. And that's what this group is doing. And the good news, these are popular. Most of them are polling at over 80% with conservatives, moderates, and progressives. They're common sense. They can be passed all across the United States. They can be done through a variety of, of methods, through ballot initiatives, through lobbying, through legal fights, through innovation. They can be done through the courts, counties, in legislatures, cities, and eventually in Congress. That's exciting. And then number three, powerful movement. We have to remember our history. We have to remember the suffragettes. Do you think that woman was in her comfort zone when she was fighting for her right to vote? How about the people fighting for, against segregated schools? These people put it on the line. The civil rights movement, the gay rights movement. We have to not just match their, their fearlessness, we have to match their smarts. The gay rights movement has been incredible in their strategy and the way they, they figured out, okay, you guys are gonna go over here and do this. We're communicating, the philanthropy was incredibly sophisticated. We have to learn. And then look at ourselves. Less than two years ago, 1,300 of us got arrested on the US Capitol for democracy. We are a movement on the rise. And what's really special about today, bringing it back to Unrig, it was so powerful for me this morning to pop my head into a room of about 25 of the most fearless and important leaders working around the country on this really wonky issue called gerrymandering reform. Thank you. Gerrymandering people are always insane. And, uh, and so many of these people, these are people who are going to win major victories this year in several states around the country. That's exciting. That's exciting. And most of these people had never met each other. That, that sucks. But they met each other today. And those kinds of side meetings happened all around this campus today. And that is awesome. And that's what a movement is made out of. So these are the three ways that we can do better because do better we must. This is not okay. Child poverty among the worst in the developed world. It is not good enough to have healthcare that is ranked the most expensive in the world. It is not good enough to see US life expectancy lowering in comparison to other countries, to see a prison population higher per capita than Russia and China. It's not good enough to see a country where the government is so polarized and gridlock they can't pass common sense government efficiencies to stop government waste. Schools that are declining in comparison to the rest of the world an inability to pass forceful policy to stop climate change, which is gonna make our planet inhospitable for humans in just a few hundred years. This doesn't happen in a great nation. In a great nation, leaders do the right thing. They act responsibly, they act rationally. We, the people, prosper. We innovate, we lead, we inspire the rest of the world, we're proud. So why are we here in New Orleans this weekend at Unrig? We are here to be strategic. We're here to catalyze solutions. We're here to build that bigger tent. We're here to build critical mass. We're here to foster real collaboration, real trust, real compassion, real kindness to our fellow human beings. We are here to become unstoppable, together. Thank you.
down here. Okay. Building a powerful political movement requires people whose courage inspires us and push us to the next level in pursuit of the greater good. The Unrigged Courage Awards are presented in recognition of extraordinarily brave efforts to unrig politics. Tonight, we honor four of those people. Our first Courage Award goes to a remarkable mother and daughter, Angela and Tessa Yarbrough. Angela Yarbrough and her daughter Tess walked over 140 miles in 10 days to protest the corrupting influence of money in politics. They, along with hundreds of others, had vowed to sit on the steps of the U.S. Capitol, risking arrest in order to get their message out. Tess was the only minor arrested that day. Separated from the others, she spent 12 hours in a holding cell before her release at 3 a.m. to her very worried mother. Angela said that she and Tess knew the consequences, and there was never a question that they would follow through to send an important message to the country. Angela, Tessa, you walked, you risked arrest, and you are an inspiring mother-daughter team. For your extraordinary actions, I present the first Unrigged Courage Award. Please welcome Angela and Tessa Yarbrough. at Represent Us for this award and for working to make true democracy a reality in America. And thank you to everyone who marched and sat in with us in April 2016 for your companionship, your dedication, and your courage. And thank you to my partner in crime for being so awesome and for letting me do illegal things. <laughs> You know, we didn't actually plan on Tessa getting arrested, but af after we'd walked, and she'd walked all those miles alongside such committed people, she said, Mom, I can't stop here. I want to sit in. And I resisted, but she was so persistent and articulate, and in the end, I couldn't stand between her and what she so strongly believed she needed to do. But in our minds, we're here representing the, hundred, the more than 100 others who marched with us and the hundreds who were arrested at the Capitol with us and the thousands of people who, like you, are every day stepping out of their comfort zones and into this fight for democracy. And we could say from experience, if you keep doing what you believe you need to do, if you're persistent and don't take no for an answer, nothing will stand in your way. You may not recognize me, but I'm Carrie Washington. Do you like my hair? <laughs> As you can see, I'm stuck in production, which is why I can't be with you. I'm over here focusing on corruption in the pretend Washington, D.C., but you guys are where I want to be, focusing on ending corruption in the real Washington, D.C. Thank you for being there. I'm so excited that unrigging the system is catching on all across the country and across political lines. This is a moment where we have to come together across ideologies to say we're going to fix the system and put the power back in the hands of the people. So thank you for being there. I'm not with you in body, but I am with you in spirit. I'm sending so much love. Have a great time. Unrig the system. Get it done. Make it happen. I'll see you out there in the world fighting this fight. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, Nikki Glazer. Thank you, thank you. Keep going as I make my way to the stage. Keep clapping. 
Oh my gosh. It was like you guys chose to do that on your own. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Um, I am a comedian, so just get ready for that. I might say some inappropriate things. We're all cool with it. Okay, okay. We're more than cool. I am here tonight because I care about, also because, um, more because Jennifer Lawrence asked me to be here. Um, my dear, dear friend, Jennifer. She, you know, I said I'd do it if I can call you my dear, dear friend, Jennifer. And her assistant hasn't gotten back to me on that. But I just went with it because, you know, we're best friends. So that's kind of how that works. It's true. I, I'd be here if it was a NAMBLA conference, if Jennifer asked me. It's, I have no moral compass. I, Jennifer Lawrence asks you to jump. You say, how high and off what building? And are we jumping together? I love you. Is this a suicide pact? Let's do it. Oh, just me? I'll do it still. That's what you say. I actually do care about this cause, so that's kind of rad because I'd be here anyway, but it's pretty sweet. I usually, like, I don't like to talk about politics in my act because I'm stupid and, um, and I just feel like I don't know things. And whenever I post something on Instagram about Trump, I always get some troll being like, shut up, you thin lip bitch. I'm like, oh God, it really hurts because I don't have lips. And, um, up here, but you know, I'm not gonna go into, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> no, but I don't like know things and I get nervous when people talk about politics around me, I just kind of clam up, you know? Uh, someone mentioned Syria, I was like, oh, I heard they merged with XM and that's been good for them or whatever, and it's like. <sighs> I finally learned what a super pack was. I just thought it was like a big pack of gum sold at Costco, but apparently it's something way worse. <sighs> but it's, uh, yeah, I care about this. I, I really do. I think, it's, I think it's fucked up that you can just like buy votes and buy, like buy Congress people. It's just, when you really look at the, the, the facts, like I watched the videos on the website and I was blown away. I was like, the f whether or not people care about an issue has zero impact, like has no impact. I'm like, that's hard to swallow. And I don't say that things are hard to swallow often. That's an oral sex joke. And I, I, no impact, no impact. That's nuts. Like that's, it's almost like, you know what it's like? It's like the number of nude pictures I send my ex-boyfriend has no impact on whether he'll take me back or not. That's how it feels. And that's also why we're here tonight. I want you guys to put in a good word if you know him. You don't. It is crazy. You can just buy votes. And that's what's so cool is because when you're not, not being paid, you, you do what you care about. You do what you do, what the people want. And that's why I'm so grateful I'm not being paid tonight because <laughs> if I were, oh my God, can you imagine how boring this would be if they actually paid me, but they didn't. So I'm gonna talk about my pussy because it's what the people want. I can tell, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, we'll get to it later. We really will. Uh, I hope some of you do, too. Later, later. Um, I'm at the Sheridan room, 1113. Why did I give the real number? I could have obviously thought of a different number, but I chose not to because... Oh, God. I love it here in New Orleans. I really do. It's so cool. It's, this is happening here. It's, it's a weird town for me to be in because I'm sober. And I don't know if anyone has ever been sober in New Orleans, but it's, it's the worst. It's like, it's like being <laughs> like a, a Mormon at an orgy. That's how it feels. It really feels that way. Like I, I wanna take part and I can't. I miss it, I miss drinking. Tonight I just did, I took out one contact lens just so I could like feel a little drunk and make a couple mistakes. So. I hope that goes, I hope that happens. No, but I love it here, I love the Big Easy. It's not just because it was my nickname in high school, it's also because it's just a beautiful town with so much history. Um, God, what else? Here's the thing, it's like, this is what's kind of cool about why we're all here. I, w I love something that has a solution, like there's a clear solution in place that I don't really know the details of, but like there's, there's a way to like, remedy this, right? 
That's not the case with like so much stuff. Like most things you're just like, we're kind of screwed, you know? And there's no, like global warming, uh, it's over. You know, like it's nice try. Remember when Al Gore tried to warn us and was like, well, you have 15 years before it's all, and it's just like, we were like, whatever, Al, you invented the internet too, shut up. And now everything's ruined. Um, but no, this is like, this has a good outcome. And um, what was else was I gonna say? Let me look at my notes just to make sure I hit everything I wanna hit. Um, oh, I'm here because Amy Schumer canceled. Uh, what else? <laughs> I wish that weren't true. I wish that was just a joke. But I'll take her scraps. I'll take them. <laughs> mm, dear God. Oh my God. And it's not, it's, it's, it's not a partisan issue. I learned that word this week and that was cool. That's good. Both sides of the fence can agree on this. The fence, not the wall that hasn't been built yet. But um, I feel like even the other side of the wall, Mexico, they would agree that government corruption sucks. I hear they have it there. I watch Narcos. So, so I've heard they'd be on board with this. Um, yeah, I did like some, re I did some research to get ready for tonight because I, like I said, I'm a real dumb, like the only thing I know about government is the reason we're here, which is that it doesn't work for us. Like that's literally all I know. So that was kind of nice to get into. But I did some research of like how a bill becomes a law. So I watched the Schoolhouse Rock video. Yes, we all love it. I don't know if you've seen the updated version, but they just recently updated it. Like, so instead of just being a bill that sits on Capitol Hill, he's now like really tan and skiing in Aspen on a trip paid for by Monsanto. I don't know if you've <laughs> seen it. That's a cool, check it out. Oh God. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, this is my point. Okay, now we're gonna get to like jokes that are tried and true, but this has been good so far. I feel really good about this. My best friend Jennifer is gonna be so happy. We're like sisters, we are sisters, is that weird? I'm her, um, maybe not, that's a little far. I can do an impression of her. I've, she doesn't even know I can do this. I'm Jennifer Lawrence, that's my impression, that's it. I can only say her saying her name. Um, I can do a Jennifer Aniston impression that usually brings down the fucking house. Um, here we go, oh, oh, that's it, that's all it is. Oh my God, guys, stop it. Oh, 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 what, oh, no. Oh, 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 oh. Huh. <laughs> that's, all, that's all it is. Thank you. I think my time's almost up, but I did want to get to something. Okay, so here's my point is like, it's really cool that, th that we can, this isn't just a problem that we're like, it's a problem, what do we do? There's a solution to it. And like I said, so often there's no solutions. Like, like there's no solution to, I'm really frustrated lately with aging. Like you can't stop it, you know? It's like really, I just moved out of LA to New York where people are uglier just to feel a little bit better about myself <laughs> because I'm 33 and it's not looking great. It's. <laughs> It's, and it got to me in my last months in LA. Can I just be honest with you guys? I got Botox and I, I, all my friends are like, don't do it, no. And I'm like, you're gonna need it if you keep making that face. Like just a warning, that's how I needed it. I really recommend Botox for those of you in the room that might, like if you're really a nice person, I feel like I'm always so empathetic. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And now I just, I can't be that way because my forehead's frozen. It's kind of fun. I like, have a resting bitch face that I've never had. And so it's good, like I went to a funeral recently and I was like, I'm sorry, your dad died. And I was sorry, but it just gave off the impression that like maybe I killed him. It was kind of cool. It's just like, I'm very sorry for his loss. So uh, yeah, Botox, I got, okay. I haven't really admitted this to like everyone, but I, because of those trolls that say, shut up, you thin lip bitch. I got, <laughs> the one's here tonight. Uh, one just clapped, like, she read my comment. <laughs> I did, sir. And I spent $800 to get it fixed. I got, I got my lips done, which I, I really regret doing. It was just because, because I've never had a lip. And I was like, I want to try one, you know, for once in my life. 
by the way, they're already gone. Don't look for them. They're not, there's nowhere to be found. They disappeared. My body metabolized them already. It sucks. It's the most expensive, disappointing meal of my life. Here's the thing about getting your lips done. Okay, so I went in to go do it because I'm scared of aging. And, um, and the woman was like, okay. Oh, she walked in with a syringe. She looked insane. I had prepaid or I would have left, but she looked so scary. She, okay, you know how they say, never trust a skinny chef. Well, never trust a plastic surgeon who looks like a shiny cat. Like that's also some sage advice because this woman was either 24 or 79. Like she was, you know how like board games have like ages two to 99. It's like she was a board game range of age. And she was like, are you ready? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, don't worry. Listen, I know you're worried. I know subtlety. And I was like, you don't know mirrors then because look at you, you shiny sphinx. She was like, duh. And so, but she put me at ease because she showed me a book of like before and afters. And she was like, pick out which lips you want. And I found, I was like, those, you know? And she was like, that's a vagina. And I was like, I know, that's exactly what I want. That's the look I'm going for. I feel like God fucked up on me. Like, I feel like he, I got switched. Like, I feel like an Ikea desk that he hastily put together. You know what I mean? Where he's like, that's fine. And it kind of wobbles, but he's like, I'm not putting, I'm not taking it apart to put it back together again or whatever. <sighs> okay, I really have to go. I've been told I look younger without makeup. Sometimes guys say that. One guy was like, you look 24 without makeup. And I was complimented and then I realized he just meant I looked like Kiefer Sutherland when he's stressed out. So, all right, thank you guys very much. Good night. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. I didn't think she'd be that funny. Now I have to like talk about a, an astronaut and follow that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Nikki. Our next guest is a retired NASA astronaut, a decorated fighter pilot and test pilot, explorer, entrepreneur, and humanitarian. So we should all just go home. <laughs> he flew on both the US space shuttle and the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Please welcome Ron Garen. Good evening. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to hear a story? Maybe I should step back a little bit. <laughs> well, good, because I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about a monumental event that happened nearly 50 years ago an event that fundamentally changed the way we see ourselves, an event that, although it forever changed the course of human history, it's an event that, for the most part, has been forgotten. The story starts on a winter morning of December 21st, 1968, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Atop the tallest, the heaviest, the most powerful rocket ever brought to operational status, the Saturn V, sat the crew of Apollo 8, Commander Frank Borman, Command Module Pilot Jim Lovell, and Lunar Module Pilot Bill Anders. The goal of the mission is to become the first crewed spacecraft to travel to the moon, enter into orbit around the moon, and of course, return safely to Earth. Three days later, on December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1968, as the crew of Apollo 8 came up from behind the dark side of the moon on their fourth orbit, they experienced something never seen before by human eyes. Commander Borman was the first to see the amazing sight, and he called in excitement to the others, taking a black and white photo in the process. Bill Anders took the more famous color photo, and it was all captured on the flight voice recorder. Oh, God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, that's pretty. Hey, don't take that, I'm scheduled. <laughs> you got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick. Oh, you? man, that's Curry. crazy. Quick. As, the, as the crew saw the Earth coming up from behind the lunar horizon, I wonder if they realized the significance of that moment. They had just become the first humans in history 
to see the whole planet hanging in the blackness of space, and the first to capture that for the rest of us. This image, known as Earthrise, is probably the most influential photograph ever taken, with its simple message that we are one people traveling on one planet towards one common future. This revolutionized how we see our world, how we see ourselves. Four decades later, I also was able to see our planet from the vantage point of space. To start. Three coming up. Three, two, three to hundred. Hang on. Booster ignition. Auto two. Auto two. Discovery. Auto, auto. Monte Kudasai. That's the I see three at one oh four. I see planet. a command and a roll. Houston Discovery roll program. I am LBLH. LBLH. Roger roll Discovery. Roger roll Discovery. Houston now controlling the flight of Discovery, a man-made rising sun. Oh, what a view up to that. At eight and a half minutes after liftoff, all of us inside the spacecraft went from being pushed into our seats at a force three times our weight, three Gs, to being weightless instantly as the three main engines cut off abruptly according to plan. At this point, I thought to myself, we made it. By that, I meant we survived. But I was also acutely aware that my childhood dream of flying in space had just come true. But on that first day, that first day in space, the most memorable moment was when I got to look out the window for the first time. When I was able to unstrap, float over to a window, and take in this beautiful scene. It was just absolutely breathtaking. This was an incredibly moving visual experience, but it was much, much more than just a visual experience. What I experienced in space was a profound sense of gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity to see the planet from that perspective, and gratitude for the planet that we've been given. And in some way, I, I can't really fully explain, being physically detached from the Earth made me feel deeply interconnected with everyone on it. Now this feeling of interconnectedness became even more real on my second mission to space. My second mission to space, where I spent half of 2011 living and working on board the International Space Station, started with a launch from Kazakhstan on a Soyuz spacecraft. During my six months in the space, I got into a routine where I would almost say goodnight to the Earth as it was time to get ready for bed. I'd go to the cupola, which is this windowed observatory on the bottom of the space station. I would just look back at the Earth for a little while. And as I would gaze back at this beautiful scene, I would think about what the next 50 years are going to look like. How far would we progress in overcoming the challenges and problems facing our planet? Now, I launched into space with the belief that right now we already have all the resources, all the technology necessary to solve many, if not all, the problems facing our planet. So I spent a good deal of my time earth gazing, pondering the question, if this is true, why do they still remain? The seeds to the answer to that question were planted three years earlier on my, my first space flight. On the third spacewalk of that mission, my feet were clamped to the end of the space station's robotic arm. And with me attached to the arm, it was flown through a maneuver that we called the windshield wiper, which took me across a big arc across the top of the space station in the back. At the top of this arc, I was 100 feet above the space station, looking down at this enormous complex against the backdrop of our indescribably beautiful planet, 240 miles below. It, it took my breath away. But more compelling than the beauty of this scene was the incredible human accomplishment that the space station represents. It's not only a technological accomplishment, probably the most complicated, complex structure ever built, but it's an amazing example of the power of cooperation. Fifteen nations built the International Space Station. Some of these nations weren't always the best of friends. Some were on opposite sides of the Cold War, opposite sides of the space race. Some fought wars, wars against each other. But somehow, they were able to set aside their differences and do this amazing thing in space. And as I hovered up there above the space station, I wondered, what would the world look like if we could overcome our political and our cultural barriers to collaboration and bring that same level of cooperation down to the Earth's surface. Now, I was born in the year that Yuri Gagarin became the first human to fly in space. Fifty years later, almost to the day, from the very same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from, I launched into space as a fully integrated member of a Russian spacecraft crew with a couple of Russian military officers. And as we stood at the base of this rocket that would take us to space on a cold April evening from a previous top secret Soviet military installation, I looked up at the rocket and I saw an American flag and a Russian flag 
side by side. That image was burned into me. For the first 15 years of my adult life, I trained to fight the Russians, our nation's most menacing enemy at the time. I was a Cold War fighter pilot stationed at the tip of the sword in former West Germany before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I fought in combat in another part of the world where I saw firsthand the horrors of war. Back then, I was operating in a two-dimensional us-versus-them world. Unfortunately, this is still the primary operating system of our planet. This is the image of our world that our civilization is presently based on. A two-dimensional landscape of nation-states fighting and competing over resources and ideologies. A landscape where not only nations compete, but corporations, NGOs, special interest groups, political parties. And this is the real world. This is the image taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts nearly 50 years ago. This image proclaims the truth that we are one people traveling together through the universe on one planet towards one shared destiny. From this vantage point, you can't see nation states. What you can see is the fragile oasis of our home planet Earth. So let's look back at this two-dimensional image again. This is something that we created, not based on reality. It may have served us in the past. It may have been appropriate before we realized how interdependent we all are. It may have been appropriate before we realized that we could destroy the very life support systems of our planet. And it may have been appropriate back when nation states could operate in relative isolation. This is no longer the appropriate guidepost for our actions. This, and neither is this. <laughs> this gerrymandered map, or this, or this. This is the appropriate guidepost for our actions. This is reality. The problem is, our political decisions are currently based on the two-dimensional map. So in order for humanity to progress and to prosper, we need to deal with the very real problems that we face in the context of the real world. We need to build a future based on the image of Earthrise. The image of Earthrise has three key pillars, interdependence, long-term thinking, and profound collaboration, all wrapped in the blanket of empathy and compassion. We can no longer have a two-dimensional map as our model. Humanity is at a critical point, a point like never before in history. We're at a critical fork in the road. Before us are two paths. One is to continue down the two-dimensional us versus them path that we're presently on. To continue living under the lie that special interest groups, political parties can pursue their own self-interest independent of our country and the world. To continue down the path of increased nationalism, tribalism, parochialism, all which will lead to despair and destruction. The other path is founded on the principles of Earthrise, which will lead to a visionary, restorative future, a future where 10 billion humans can live within our planetary limits in peace and prosperity, a future we would all want to be a part of. I'm here representing a coalition of international astronauts that are coming together to promote the values of Earthrise. We have proven that by working together, we can accomplish anything. By all of you being here, you've already stepped up to be agents of change. You already embody this new system. So let's come together and build a future that we'd all want to be a part of. And so, to bring this home, I want to share with you another story. I want to share with you the story of my return to Earth after my six-month mission in space. When it was time to return, my two Russian crewmates and I got into our Soyuz spacecraft, we undocked, we did a couple of laps around our planet, and as we crossed the south tip of South America, we fired our engines to enter into the atmosphere. We had this fiery, violent ride through the atmosphere at five miles a second. The parachutes opened, they threw us all over the place. Eventually, we smashed into the ground. We bounced, we rolled, we flipped over. And now my window is pointed at the ground. And out of my window, I saw a rock, a flower, and a blade of grass. 
And I remember thinking to myself, I'm home. And what was really interesting about that thought was I was home, but I was in Kazakhstan. So to me, at that moment, my home wasn't just Houston, Texas, where at the time I lived with my family. My home was Earth. And our definition of that word home has profound implications for how we problem solve, how we treat our planet, how we treat our, each other. And broadening our definition of the word home does not come with it a requirement to abandon where we came from, our political or cultural affinities. It simply means putting all those things, looking at those things in the context of the bigger picture. So as a fellow crewmate on Spaceship Earth, I want to thank all of you for what you're doing and what you will do to help make life on our planet as beautiful as our planet looks from space. And by working together, we do not have to accept the status quo, the political status quo in our country. So together, let's nudge the trajectory of our country and our world to a more beautiful future for all. Thank you. Hi, Adam McKay here in Los Angeles, and I apologize that I am not there. I don't know what to say. It's the finals for my karate tournament. Uh, I got to fight a guy hand to hand in an abandoned basement in City of Industry. I will be victorious, so don't worry about me. But uh, priorities. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for showing up down there in New Orleans for the uh, Unrig the System Summit. Bottom line is, I think we're all sick of this. Uh, big money has choked our democracy. We're in a situation where the people's will is not being heard. And what we really need to do is get every voter out there making a choice that their number one issue they're voting for, whether they're right wing, left wing, is get dirty money out of politics. And I hope this weekend's festivities are leading uh, an energetic groundswell of support for that idea. I thank everyone that's there. You guys rule, and I wish so badly I was there. Please welcome to the stage Desmond Mead. If you could just take a moment and pay close attention to these words, they're very familiar words. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and the six most important words, with liberty and justice for all, not for some. Not for the rich, not for just whites, but for all. And until we have justice for all, none of us can have it. None of us. In 2005, I found myself standing in front of railroad tracks. It was one of those hot and humid days in South Florida. And as I stood there, I was a broken man. And for moments, I was able to block out that oppressive heat and humidity. Because as I was standing there, the only thing that I can think of was how much pain I was going to feel when I jumped in front of the oncoming train. 
You see, that day I stood there, I was a drug addict. I was homeless. I was recently released from prison. I didn't own anything but the clothes on my back. Now, I knew that my parents didn't raise me to be in that position, but there I was, and I waited, and I waited. And I was thinking when that train hit me, was I gonna die instantly or did I have to go through moments of, of agonizing pain? But even the thought of the pain associated with getting ran over by a train did not make me move. And so I waited and I waited. But the train didn't come that day for some reason. I say, but by the grace of God. And I crossed those tracks and I walked two blocks and I checked myself into drug treatment. And after completing drug treatment, I moved into a homeless shelter. And, was, and while I was living in that homeless shelter, I decided that I needed to do something to break that vicious cycle of drug addiction. And so I enrolled in college in a paralegal program and I, I did extremely well and I was encouraged to continue my education, so I pursued a bachelor's in public safety management with a concentration in criminal justice. I figured since I had a lot of experience getting arrested on the streets and appearing before judges that somehow that experience would translate into success in the classroom, and it did. And eventually I was accepted into law school and in May of 2014, I graduated from FIU College of Law with a Juris Doctorate degree. And while the applause sounds so beautiful, and I may have to reclaim a couple minutes of my time, <laughs> my story does not have a happy ending because I live in the state of Florida, and because of that, in spite of the many obstacles I've been able to overcome, in spite of a commitment, a lifelong commitment to giving back to my community, to making my world a much better place, I still cannot vote. In spite of the many contributions to my community, I cannot practice law. And I can't even afford to buy a home in some places because I'm restricted until my civil rights have been restored. Because I live in the state of Florida. Where over 1.68 million Floridians face a lifetime ban. They say felons. You probably said felons. We use the word returning citizens. Because we know that individuals, because we know that individuals who've made mistakes are still somebody's son and daughter and father and mother, that they're human beings first. And so rather than give them a scarlet letter of shame to carry on for the rest of their lives, we decided to change things and started calling them returning citizens. And so now here we are, 1.68 million returning citizens living in the state of Florida where we have elected officials, where we have a system that refuses to restore our civil rights back to us when we've served our time. And at some point in 2011, we said enough was enough. And we got together and we started going throughout the state of Florida just talking to regular everyday people. Whether they were black, whether they were white, whether they were progressive, whether they were conservative, we talked to everyone that would stop long enough to listen. And what we found blew my mind. That felon disenfranchisement is not an African American issue. While we may close our eyes when we think of the criminal justice system and the image that
pops up as an African-American young man with gold teeth and dreads and probably pants hanging off his butt. The reality is, this is not an African-American issue. Of the 1.68 million people in Florida who cannot vote, African-Americans only account for a third. So that means that there are three times as many people in the state of Florida who cannot vote that don't look like me. They look like most of you out in this audience today. And so I know that rather than it being an African-American issue, it's an all-American issue. The other thing that I found out while traveling the state of Florida was that they would say, you would hear the narrative, oh, Republicans don't want felons to get the right to vote because they know they'll vote Democrat. But the problem that I had with that was that that means that only Democrats get in trouble. And I thought about it, and I was like, wait a minute. When I was arrested, the police didn't ask me if I was Democrat or Republican. <laughs> when I was sentenced, the judge didn't ask me if I was Democrat or Republican. And as I traveled the state of Florida, I found that there were so many people that were impacted, no matter what their political persuasion was, and that that narrative that created an illusion that only Democrats cared about getting their rights restored, or only Democrats were the ones that were losing their rights, was a false narrative. And I understood that there was a system that needed to be unrigged. I understood that there was a system that created these narratives in order to divide us and to move us further apart from each other. I understood that there was a system that was designed to make us lose our contact along the lines of humanity. When I looked at this system, what I seen was that the only victims of this system was us. When you look at the partisan bickering back and forth, we never won. We never benefited from it. It was systems that told us that the blacks are the problem. It was systems that told us that Mexicans are the problems. When in reality, when we think about immigration, if we really look at it, we know that immigration was not a Latino issue. It has never been a Latino issue. We've had immigrants from all countries. And amongst those immigrants were African, of people of African descent. But it's that system that creates this false narrative that has us putting immigration squarely in a Latino box and criminal justice squarely in an African American box. When the reality is that they were both the same because we were dealing with human dignity and human rights. The system tries to prevent us from understanding this. And when we stood up and when we created an all-inclusive campaign that was all-American, that chose to pick people over politics, that chose to transcend racial and, and political lines, we discovered something that was beautiful. We discovered the essence of what made this country beautiful. A great example was after the hurricanes, when people came together. They didn't wait for politicians. They came together, and no one cared the color of your skin. No one cared who you voted for in the last election. All they seen was it was another human being in need, and they came to aid. And it is that spirit that we embrace because it is only along the lines of humanity that we're able to accomplish so much. It is in moments like that where this country truly is a beautiful country, where this country truly is great. And we took that. In spite of the fact that the system told us we would never have any movement on this issue. As of last week, 
we have qualified the voting restoration amendment for the 2018 ballot. The system said that we would never get it off the ground, but the people said, yes, we could, and they did. The system said that this poor, formerly homeless drug addict, African-American male, didn't have the skill set to even lead an initiative, but we're now at the cusp of transforming not only the state of Florida, but this country that we're at the cusp of being a shining example of how we really get things done in this country. And that's by shedding the partisan the labels and shedding the, the racial labels and, and coming together at that sacred space, that space where we were born into. No one was born into a Republican. No one was born into being a Democrat. No one was born into whatever. They were born as a human being, as a human being. And so when the system tells us that we have to run a campaign based on fear, we say no, we run it based on love. When the system says we have to run a campaign based on division, we say no. Ours is based on inclusion. Because if this country is to be great, then all of us must be in this thing together. And, and so, and so, while you, we will have people that's attaching to this campaign that may have other ideas in mind, I'm going to tell you that what is going to save this country is not another blue state. What's going to save this democracy is not another red state. Our prosperity, our hope for a more inclusive democracy can only be saved by the United States. And so, I ask you all tonight that if you believe in creating a more inclusive democracy, would you stand to your feet? If you believe that there should be justice and liberty for all, stand to your feet. If you believe, if you believe that no matter what your sexual identity is, that you should be treated with dignity, Stand to your feet. If you believe that there's no such thing as being illegal, that there are no illegal human beings, stand to your feet. If you believe in forgiveness, stand to your feet. And I want you all to, before you sit down, I want you all to just say it with me. And when we get to those last six words, when you get to these last six words, I need it to come from here. Because we must unrig this system in order for those six words to be true. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's welcome back the Preservation All-Stars.
Jiggle Blues. Everybody singing the Jiggle Blues. You know the whole town is drinking. I like my coffee and I like my tea. But the doggone sugar turned sour on me. I'm so unhappy. I'm so blue. I could live right down there and die. But you can say what you choose. Cause I'm all confused. I've got those old sugar blues. Yeah, pretty baby. I've got those old sugar blues. I'd say. Sugar Blues Everybody sang in the Sugar Blues You know the whole town is ringing I got a woman live back in town as sweet as can be But the doggone fool she turned sour on me I'm so unhappy, yes, I'm so blue. I could jump in the Mississippi River and drown. But you can say what you choose, cause I'm all confused. I've got those old sugar blues, yeah, pretty baby. I've got those old sugar blues
In 2012, Nika Campbell lost her 10-month-old daughter, Amelia, during heart surgery at St. Mary's Hospital in Florida. Amelia was one of an unusually high number of infant deaths at St. Mary's that occurred while the hospital was making six-figure contributions to Florida politicians, who in turn eliminated regulatory oversight of the infant surgery program. Nika was one of a handful of parents who bravely shared their personal stories, speaking out against the hospital and the brazen corruption, ultimately leading to the end of the hospital's infant surgery program. Nika shared her story to save others from the heartbreak that she suffered. For her incredible courage in the face of unimaginable loss, it is an honor to present our second Courage Award to Nika Campbell. <laughs> I'll take it. Mika. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Congratulations. When I started down this path, I never imagined that I'd be standing here receiving an award for being a mother who felt compelled to speak up. But here I am, and I thank God for giving me strength throughout this entire ordeal to talk about what happened to Amelia at a time when my heart was filled with nothing but pain. I'm thankful for the courage of those who came alongside me, stood with me, and supported me in the fight to prevent more harm to more families and more babies. I am thankful for the moral fortitude of journalists and other members of the media who provided a platform for me to give voice to this tragedy. Lastly, I thank everyone hearing the sound of my voice for listening. I believe it will take all of us working together collectively to ensure that this preventable suffering never occurs again. Please welcome Honey Honey. Change your mind and make it right. So 
This is our most nonpartisan song. <laughs> it's called Yours to Bear. Share my days with now. 
free snacks and just we're so elated to see so many different people from all over the country here to do something really special so thank you guys thanks for listening and uh having us and we hope to see you again on the road sometime this is our last song it's called big man this is ben and i'm suzanne thank you guys Baby, ain't happy. 
much, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thank you, honey, honey. I'm supposed to remind everybody, I don't know how Twitter works, but it's hashtag unrig the system, so do something with that. <laughs> Whatever that is. Our next speaker is a professor and former White House ethics lawyer for President George W. Bush. But rather than kick back in his ivory tower, he has spent the past several years seemingly everywhere, calling out corruptions, and ethics violations with force and power that has transformed the national debate. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Painter. Good evening. I had a wonderful time with everyone this afternoon and uh, I brought my 14-year-old daughter down here, and we decided to uh, go and watch the Mardi Gras parade. So really, uh, lots of fun. You get these beads. But it was really quite, uh, quite fascinating. You're so standing there on the side, and the kids and everyone is putting their hands out, begging for the, for the beads, all the stuff that's being thrown down from the floats by the men in masks and white tie, the rich guys, yeah. They're throwing it over the side and everyone's got their hands up and oh, I got a lot of beads. It's like, this is exactly like the politicians, you know, lining up the side of the streets and the rich guys in the white tie tossing the, the, the goodies over and of course the men in the masks, you never know who they are. It could be the Koch brothers. Are the Koch brothers here tonight? Any Koch brothers? Oh, they're, they're busy destroying the environment. Um, it could be the Mercers. I don't know what they're planning. Oh, gee. Um, don't get me going there. Um, it could be Vladimir Putin. I don't know. Um, you know, money these days in politics, I saw a graph that was presented this afternoon about the amount of dollars and billion dollars in the last presidential election. And I was going to raise my hand and say, that's the dollars. Now, where are the rubles <laughs> and, and the rest of it? Because what we are talking about tonight uh, is an issue that's critically important to the survival of our country as an independent country. We were once a colony. We were divided up into spheres of influence by the British and the French and the Spaniards. Every European power wanted to have influence over what happened here. And then we joined with other powers to do the same around the world. That's what colonialism was about. Well, the founders of this country, though, in the Tea Party, I'm talking about the real Tea Party, not these phonies who run around trying to uh, justify the Citizens United case, but, but the real Tea Party. When they saw that a multinational corporation, the East India Company, was bringing its tea into Boston Harbor, the East India Company had already corrupted most of the members of Parliament, who were uh, Edmund Burke, had great speeches on the floor of the House of Commons about the corruption of the East India Company. The American people didn't want it here. That's why the tea went into Boston Harbor. It was taxation without representation. And that's exactly what we have today. We pay the taxes. We pay the taxes. And a very, very small group of people gets to decide what's done with the money, how our government works, how we are regulated, who is not regulated, the Koch brothers. Um, and this oligarchy that controls our government is no longer just Americans, but it is global because capitalism is global. This is what globalization is all about. And President Donald Trump can rant and rave about globalization as he's going to visit his properties all over the world and doing the sword dance in Saudi Arabia and the rest of it. But globalization is here 
and corporate wealth is global. And then they say it is illegal to have foreign campaign money in a United States election. It is illegal for foreign national to contribute anything to an American campaign. It is illegal for a foreign corporation to do that or for a foreign government to do that. Well, right. It's also illegal to drink under the age of 21. <laughs> and I wrote in my book on campaign finance reform that was published in January of 2016 about all of the ways you could get foreign government money into United States campaigns through corporate acquisitions, through subsidiaries, through joint venture agreements, and all the ways it could be done. I thought I had figured it out, but Vladimir Putin was several steps ahead of me. When I published that book, it was just months before President Trump won the uh, Republican nomination, then Donald Trump, candidate Trump. I never knew about the various tricks that the Russians are up to, but there will come a time when we put this behind us, this disaster, and some people are let off in handcuffs, I think Robert Mueller's working on that. Yeah. But we are not going to be able to overcome this problem if we don't fix money in politics. Because there will always be a country that wants to own a United States president. Other countries are going to look at this situation and say, Russia is not the only country that's going to pull this off. We are going to pull this on, maybe with the Democrats and maybe again with the Republicans. We don't know. And look at the way we responded to it just this past couple of days when we see foreign infiltration of an American election, foreign espionage. We see close associates of the president are hanging around with the Russians and we're going to have a big fight over the FISA warrant and pointing the fingers at our own intelligence. What we don't understand is that the United States is vulnerable to foreign infiltration of our elections, and we are not going to solve that problem just by getting rid of Donald Trump. We're going to solve that problem by getting rid of Citizens United, having some serious changes in the Supreme Court or in our Constitution. We need to reverse that decision and get the money out of politics, the big money. Second, we need much more disclosure. President Obama suggested that. It would be perfectly constitutional. The Supreme Court not, was, would not stamp in the way. And guess what? Congress wouldn't do anything. Why not? Because they're getting too much of this stuff. Yep. And last, we need small dollar donors to have a meaningful role in this system. And that's why I have suggested that Congress ought to enact a law that could be done by statute saying that the first $200 of our tax dollars should go to the candidate or the campaign party of our choice. That's taxation with representation. And I urge taxation only with representation. And I have said that I don't think anybody ought to, pay to have to pay taxes unless they have that right. Now, I know my more conservative friends just want to say, let's just not pay taxes, but that's not, no, no. But I should not have to be paying taxes to support a government that's run by the Koch brothers and the Mercer family and Vladimir Putin. It's not going to be happening, not in my country. So thank you very much. Let's continue the fight. And we are going to get money out of politics and make this country the democracy that it really should be and that we all believe in. Thank you. Hey, New Orleans, what's up? It's Ed Helms here. Uh, I'm so sorry I'm not there with you in person. I would love to be there, but I'm trapped here in sunny Southern California. Why? Well, because Represent Us refused to pay my $500,000 appearance fee. Go figure. I guess they've got more important things to do with the money. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but hey, you're there, and that's awesome. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or conservative or progressive. The one thing that we can all agree on is that The Office was a great show, right? I mean, come on, that was so fun. What a great run we had there. But also, the other thing we can agree on is that corruption sucks. Yeah, corruption, not good, okay? But you're there right now to get things back on track, and I am so with you in spirit. So have a great weekend, and keep fighting the good fight. Cheers.
Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Adam Yender. All right, thank you guys. Give it up for me, the least famous person at this entire event. Thank you. I feel like when they said, please welcome Adam Yenser, it's the first time a thousand people in New Orleans went, who dat, and weren't talking about the Saints. <laughs> I am a little bit famous. I'm a writer for the Ellen DeGeneres show, and, uh, and I've been recognized in public once. <laughs> This is true, this girl came up to me at a bar and she goes, oh my gosh, I've seen you on Ellen. Can I get a picture with you? And I said, sure, and I tried to get a selfie of us, but nothing happened. And I said, oh, it says your memory is full. You'll have to delete a picture to make room. And she takes her phone and she goes, mmm, nah. <laughs> it's the kind of star power that you're dealing with here tonight. <laughs> I'll let you know, because I work for Ellen, I am a, a clean comedian. I only do clean material. I only use words you can say on daytime television, like darn and heck and shithole. <laughs> now, before I came out here, they did give me an announcement they wanted to make. This is really, they said the, uh, the buses are not leaving at 10.30, they're leaving at 11 or whenever this event is over. So you don't have to worry about catching a bus or anything like that. Um, that's not, there's no way to make that funny. They just gave me that announcement to make. <laughs> they couldn't have Ed Helms record that ahead of time. <laughs> no, but give it up for Unrig the System. This is a great event. They're, uh... They're putting me up at the Sheridan, which is nice. Usually when I'm on the road for stand-up, I stay at Motel 6. And then some nights I'm in the mood for something a little cleaner and classier and I'll just sleep in the car. <laughs> I was trying to find this building. I was over at the uh, LBC at the registration desk and I go, oh, where's the McAllister Auditorium? And the lady there, she goes, oh, I can give you GPS coordinates. And I was like, oh, well, how far is it? And she goes, see those white pillars over there? She goes, that's it. <laughs> It's like, then there's no reason to bring satellites into this. <laughs> well, this really is a great event, though. It's nice to see people from both sides of the aisle coming together to get money and corruption out of politics. We all have the same message for Washington, and I think we picked the right place to deliver it. Because if there's one city the federal government never ignores, it's New Orleans. <laughs> You think politicians would like New Orleans, because like, like in Washington, when they sexually harass women, they have to pay them millions of dollars. Down here, you just have to give them a bead necklace. <laughs> and if you have another bead necklace, you can do it again. <laughs> I think we do, uh, we do have to get our government working again, though. It's completely dysfunctional right now. There was a government shutdown last week. What happened was the government shut down and then Congress stayed in session all night and into the weekend getting it running again. So uh, how our democracy runs is when the government shuts down and they're not supposed to be working, they stay late and work. <laughs> then when they get it running again, they're supposed to work, they're like, all right, let's take off and play golf. <laughs> it's nice to have a bipartisan event like this. Like this country spends way too much time fighting over stupid issues. We get so divided over stupid problems. Like one of the things they're fighting over right now is transgender bathrooms. Like whether transgender people should have to use the bathroom that matches their biological sex or the bathroom that matches their gender identity. And both sides are upset because they don't want to have to use a public bathroom with someone who makes them uncomfortable. Which makes perfect sense. Unless you've ever used a public bathroom. <laughs> There's always someone who makes you uncomfortable. There's always a stranger who wants to talk while you're peeing, or there's a homeless person using the sink as a shower, or someone makes eye contact through that gap in the stall door. <laughs> or there's a kid who's pushing 12 but still pulls his pants all the way down to pee. Using a public bathroom and being comfortable is not a real experience that anyone has. 
But that's what they're fighting about. Like transgender women don't want to have to use the men's room. And then some other women don't want those transgender people in their bathroom because they're biologically men. So what it all comes down to is no one wants to use the bathroom with men. <laughs> Like, as divisive as the issue is, everyone agrees that men and their bodies are disgusting. <laughs> and it's true, men's bodies are way more disgusting than women's bodies. Just look at the sexy outfits people wear. Sexiest thing a woman can wear is lingerie, which is basically nothing at all. Sexiest thing a man can wear is a three-piece suit. <laughs> Just layers and layers of material covering every inch of his horrible body. Then just to be safe, it's tied around his neck to make sure it doesn't fall off. That's why women all love that 50 Shades of Grey fetish, because when they do get a man naked, they're like, oh, you know be hot now is if you blindfolded me. <laughs> I do think it's weird that women carry an entire purse with them everywhere they go and all guys have is a wallet. Like, why do women need something 10 times bigger to carry 30% less money? I heard a few oohs, relax, it's a joke. <laughs> the gender wage gap is a joke. It's been debunked over and over again. <laughs> I have to do a few jokes like that just to prove there really is a conservative comedian on stage. <laughs> and they say the economy's getting better now, like the unemployment rate is down, people are getting back to work in this country, which sounds like a great thing at first, but as far as I can tell, it's just because everyone became an Uber driver. <laughs> The government always wants you to think this country is creating jobs, but it's not. This country created one job, which is Uber driver, and then we all signed up for it. <laughs> so now our entire economy is based on the fact that we take turns giving each other a ride to the airport <laughs> in exchange for the same $30. <laughs> So everyone Ubers now, no matter what they dream of doing, their fallback plan is to become an Uber driver. Which is weird, because when I was in philosophy class studying Nietzsche, they taught us that an Uber man was someone who could accomplish anything. <laughs> but in the real world, it turns out an Uber man is someone who's failed at everything. <laughs> and probably majored in philosophy. <laughs> Even when, I do, even when I do jokes that are a little divisive or about controversial issues, I try to find a way that, you know, both sides can come together and reach some sort of compromise. Like I saw a uh, pro-life billboard the other day. It said, babies get hiccups even before they're born, which is true, and I do not support abortion. But I bet a visit to the clinic would scare those hiccups away. <laughs> like that one, because a pro-life joke that offends pro-life people just alienates everybody. <laughs> I am pro-life, I'm pretty conservative and religious. I know religion's on the decline in this country, but I hear stories all the time that reaffirm my faith in God. Like I read about this bus driver who got mugged and they shot him, but his life was saved because the bullets were stopped by a Bible in his pocket. I mean, that is a miracle, that God blessed that man with ridiculous Bible-sized pockets. <laughs> I am a Republican. I know some people don't like Republicans. They call us bigots all the time, which doesn't even make sense anymore. We had one of the most diverse primaries in history. How can they still say Republicans are racist when one of our candidates was African American? And how can they still say Republicans are sexist when one of our candidates was a woman? And how can they still say Republicans hate immigrants when two of our candidates were raised by immigrants? Then they were all beat by a racist sexist who hates immigrants. <laughs> But no, I, I, don't, I don't hate Trump as much as some people do. I don't like Trump as much as some people do. But uh, I'll be honest, as a comedian, I am glad Donald Trump won. <laughs> it's not because he's easy to write jokes about. He's not. As a comedian, I am glad Donald Trump won because now the rest of America knows what stand-up comedy contests feel like. <laughs> so this is what happens. The person who spends years developing their material and thinks they just deserve to win never walks away with the prize because the crowd always votes for some new guy who yells hacky things as loud as he can. <laughs> like, I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, I don't like her, but I can sympathize with her. I know what she's going through right now. 
Because as a comedian, I too have lost big career opportunities to people who talk about Mexican stereotypes and imitate disabled people. <laughs> Trump is basically the first celebrity to steal Carlos Mencia's act. <laughs> And I have done stand-up for more conservative crowds before. I once did a show in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, which is a beautiful city, but they're like way more conservative than most big cities. Like most big cities have gay neighborhoods. Like out in Los Angeles, we have a West Hollywood. In New York, they have an area called Chelsea. Chicago has Boys Town. San Francisco has San Francisco. <laughs> but Anchorage isn't like that. Like the gay area of Anchorage is just called Steve's house. Steve is saving up to move to San Francisco. <laughs> Before I get out of here, I do want to thank uh, Unrig the System one more time. Give them a big round of applause, everybody. As I mentioned earlier, they put me up at the Sheridan for two nights and they paid to fly me here from Los Angeles just so I could do eight minutes of comedy, which I think we can all agree is exactly the type of wasteful political spending we need to stop. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, guys. Enjoy the rest of the night. Florida mailman Doug Hughes flew a gyrocopter onto the lawn of the U.S. Capitol to protest our broken campaign finance system. He carried 535 letters, one for each member of Congress, demanding that they take action to end the undue influence of money in politics. Doug's freedom flight made headlines in nearly every major news outlet in America. He risked his own life, served four months in prison, a year of probation, and he inspired a nation. I have thought about walking away from this whole thing because it's crazy. I'd rather die in the flight than live to be 80 years old and see this country fall. For risking it all with his audacious act, our third and final Unrig Courage Award goes to Doug Hughes. I need to tell you where that came from. In 2012, my adult son committed suicide by head-on collision, killing the driver of the other car. It screwed up my head really bad. And I realized that when I was really into the grieving process, I was also grieving the fact that age 60, I hadn't done anything more significant than signing online petitions. I knew then that this, getting the money out of politics, is the issue of our lifetimes. And I decided that, although I never agreed with what John had done, that he showed incredible determination in his last moments. Was, as with my flight, he was sending a message. He had had a fight with his girlfriend, and she was on the phone at the moment of collision. He really taught her. But I decided that this message that we must get the money out of politics was worth any risk as long as I did no injury and no property damage. I think this we must all be dedicated to, that this is the issue of our lifetimes. I thank you very much for the award.
It's my privilege to introduce the first of two very special headliners. Please give it up for Tignataro. <laughs> Could you continue to play music through my set? Um, what, are we going on four hours? Are pe what's that? I love when people get really cocky and they like yell out and then you follow up and they're like, no, thank you. Please leave me alone. Okay, I'm here to be entertained. I don't want to be spoken to. What did you say to me? I'm up here live in concert. What's that? She said 10 hours. That was not worth yelling at me. <sighs> she said it was an honor to introduce me. This is a big deal that I'm here. You know what I'm going to tell you? <sighs> you know, it's weird to be like getting laughs when I'm doing comedy and just want to be like, that is not. You're not supposed to laugh at that part. Okay. My, this isn't even a joke. This is just information. My great, great grandfather was the mayor of New Orleans. <sighs> That's what I tried to come out here and say to get started. And this woman immediately yells at me, We've been here for 10 hours. And I was like, what? I say it once, and if you miss it, that's it. But even though my great-great-grandfather was the mayor of New Orleans, I, even though I am, you know, royalty. <laughs> oh, thanks, please be seated. Let's not do standing ovations throughout my entire set. Um, I'm not the most politically active person, but I'm trying to get better about that. And what I've been doing is just showing up to any given rally and marching with a sign that just says, yeah, totally. <laughs> you have to start somewhere. Just gotta ease in. And that concludes my political material for the evening. Do you want to hear political material or do you want to hear about diarrhea? Blah, blah, blah. It sounds like, it, I, it sounds like a, a town hall meeting. Did somebody say it's the same thing when I said, do you want to hear if, <laughs> okay. All right, fine. Let me tell you something. You know what, I'm gonna save the diarrhea for the end of this. I'm gonna tell you that um, <laughs> when I was first dating my wife and I told her, I'm originally from Mississippi, and thank you, one person. We are an hour, less than an hour from Mississippi, and I get one woo. How dare you? So. When I told my wife, when we were dating, that I was originally from Mississippi, she said, when I think of people from Mississippi, I picture them barefoot. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you. Uh, but my family is actually civilized. They have jobs, they live indoors, sh they wear shoes. And um, I was down visiting Louisiana, Mississippi, seeing family, and she was flying in to meet all of my relatives. And we had maybe 10 or 12 of us piled into a van on the Gulf Coast to drive in to, of Mississippi to drive into New Orleans to spend the day, hang out in the French Quarter, walk around, eat, do whatever, kill time till she arrives. And hours later, I said, oh, Stephanie's gonna be landing any second. We gotta head over to the airport. And so we all pile back in the van, and as they do here, we, 
my family put coolers of ice down cases of beer and wine just for the trip to the airport. <laughs> and so I was driving like the nerd that I am, just sober as the day is long, get us to the airport. And uh, I said, you know, she's at baggage claim, just stay put. I'm gonna go in and get her and I will be right out. Just curbside, stay right here. I go in, I find her and we head out and I see her look and she said, is that, is that your family? They had all, all 12 of them gotten out of the van. They had pulled the coolers out onto the sidewalk. They were smoking and drinking and wildly waving, so excited to meet her. And they had taken their shoes off. After walking around the quarter all day, their feet were killing them. And I had to say, yes, that is my civilized family that you will be marrying into in two short years. Uh, we have two precious baby boys and uh, thank you. And uh, it is really tiring to hear about other people's kids. But um, it is. But it's also more exhausting to have twins. And uh, when they were about three weeks old, it was maybe four in the morning. We were so tired. Our eyes were rolling in the back of our heads, just exhausted. And Stephanie turned to me, and she's just so tired. She said, how do you have sex with a baby? <laughs> and I said, you don't. And that was the beginning of a 10 minute long misunderstanding. <laughs> she said, what do you mean you don't have sex with a baby? It's like, what do you mean, what do you mean? What are we talking about? Who did I marry? And the best part of that joke, which is true, is that there's always people in the audience that are still left going, well, you don't have sex with a baby. What are we talking about? <sighs> now for the diarrhea. Oh, politics. Um, have, have, have any people here noticed at public pools, the signs that say that you cannot go swimming if you have diarrhea. Clap if you have seen the signs. Okay. Here's the thing, I am on their side. I'm like, absolutely, you should not be swimming if you have diarrhea. My question is, how frequently was this happening? that they're like, you know what? We gotta put a sign up. <laughs> but how confident of a person do you have to be to be like, oh man. <laughs> I'm not feeling well. <laughs> Doctor said I should definitely stay home. <sighs> Stick near the toilet. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna head down to the public pool. <laughs> Go swim around <laughs> with full-blown diarrhea. And the lifeguard's like, hey, out of the pool. Me? Yeah. You can't swim with diarrhea.
So this is a problem? Yeah, I gotta get out of the pool. Well, listen, if you don't want me swimming with diarrhea, then you're gonna need to hang up a sign. Because there is no possible way I would just know that. <laughs> See, I thought I didn't have political material. <sighs> oh. Do you guys um, like impressions? Well, I don't do them. No, I love, um, I love when people, I love when people that do impressions tell you the name of the impression and then one second later they repeat the name of the impression again, like you're going to forget. Um, anyway, so this is, this is my impression. All I can think about right now is how many hateful comments are on Facebook Live right now. Anyway, um, okay. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone at home. Um, okay, so this is my impression of a person doing impressions. This is my impression of a person doing impressions. Do you like impressions? <laughs> anybody? Does anybody like impressions? Okay, good. This is my impression of a person doing impressions. My impression of a person doing impressions. Do you guys like impressions? Yeah? Okay, great. This is my impression There is a man 13 rows back that cannot handle this for a second longer. No! God, I hate you. Okay, I actually do three impressions and I would like to do them for you, aside from the one that I just nailed. Okay, the first impression To spring. Please. I know we're all very excited, but please. It's a spring. A spring. <laughs> it's by far my worst impression. That's why I start with it. It gets better from here. Okay. My next impression. of curtains opening. <laughs> curtains opening. Curtains opening. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Only if you really like it. Only if you really like it. My third and final impression is a clown horn. <laughs> clown horn. Clown horn. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
Please be seated. Thank you so much. Please. No, please be. I'm still, no. I'm still right no, in the middle of my set. I was listening to you behind the curtain. Yeah. Talk about Hold on one second. One second. We have Hold to on. talk. Yep. I'm from Kentucky and I was listening to you. Yep. And I'm barefoot. <laughs> and I was backstage and you were going about Mississippi and I was like, oh my God, I'm barefoot. And then he went on about the cooler and I was like, my dad has a policy. He will never pick up somebody from the airport without a cooler of beer. And that's how you get away with generations of alcoholism. You just call it <laughs> policy. What? It, well, it, wait, I had a and, breakthrough. And policy, I had a breakthrough that applies, because that's a word in politics. <laughs> policy. Now, before I leave, and I'm leaving, I just want to say very quickly, I said backstage that I had a show in Los Angeles, and she was like, hey, can I be on your show? And I thought, well, that's... I had to promote a movie. I wasn't just okay, obsessed with myself. I know, but I just have to explain. Yeah, I, I was like, I yeah. want to explain, too. Okay, I don't want to fight with you. I'm not fighting with you. I'll tackle Please you. Continue. I will tackle you. I could and break you like a twig. Please. And so, <laughs> Kentucky versus Mississippi. Here's the thing. I said, yeah, sure, put your shoe on. I said, sure. Sure, you can be on my show, but I'm thinking, that's weird, because it's just normally me doing an hour of stand-up and I have an opener for like 15 minutes. What is this person going to do on my show? <laughs> and then I thought, well, she can come out and just be like, hi, I have a new movie out. You should go see it and then leave. But now I'm realizing I could do stand up and you could just stand next just to me at a podium. Heckle you. Barefoot yeah. and be like, as hey. Long as there's a podium, I'll be there. I didn't realize hey. that it was stand up comedians. That would have been ridiculous. I'm not going on your show. Well, now I have to. Thank you and good night. <laughs> I hate it when my dad drinks. Um, our final speaker tonight has been electrifying American politics for years. When she served in the Ohio Senate, she was known as a fierce public interest advocate. She has the powerful ability to both unify opposing viewpoints and challenge people to live up to their highest selves. Today, she is president of our revolution, an organization that Senator Bernie Sanders created to revitalize American democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Nina Turner. Wow, unrig the system. Oh my God. Has this been an amazing night or what? I've laughed, I've cried, I've cheered. I want to give a big shout out, though, to all of the folks who won the awards tonight. Can we shout them out just one more time? Just one more time. So this is extremely powerful that people like us are coming together and leaving the political affiliation at the door. Because this moment, our coming together, all of the workshops, all of the speakers that you have heard throughout this weekend is really about the building of a movement that will make history that is unparalleled because you have people of good consciousness coming together to unrig a system that has failed far too many of us. And you know, it troubles me lots of times to see in this political environment that we would allow anybody to separate us based on political affiliation, based on race or class or gender or sexual orientation or religion. Because our mission in this moment, and I want you to leave here more inspired than you came, but to know that the change that we are seeking is up to us. And it's not about people who have fancy titles. You know, titles are good. They get you in the room, they get your phone calls returned, they're good, but purpose is better. And we need more folks who are driven by a purpose who understand that our democracy is not for sale to the highest bidder. 
We need folks who understand that when they run for office, that they're really holding the people's power in their hands, and they should use that power to uplift the people in this country who need it the most, that we can never, ever, 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 ever leave a sister or a brother behind. So I bring you message this evening. As someone who comes from a mixed family, my brother is a conservative Republican. And we talk every single morning at 7.30 a.m. I guess that's what morning means. <laughs> because I'm trying to understand the mind of a conservative Republican. And the reason why I bring up my brother, because in this heated political environment, we got some politicians from both sides of the aisle. They want to keep us so divided so that they can benefit from this. And that in 2016, people were torn asunder over the politics of other folks, forgetting that the overwhelming majority of us are left behind by a system that says that money is speech, a system that criminalizes poverty, a system that crushes the spirit and the will of people from all over this country, a system that does not benefit benefit us regardless of whether we're Republican or Democrat or Green Party or Libertarian or Black or Brown or White. We are all in this together. And my brother, although we disagree politically, if I was laid up in a hospital and needed a blood transfusion, my Republican brother would be there. If I needed a kidney, my Republican brother would be there. If I needed anything at all, he would be there. And so the purpose of Unrigged is not just for us to leave here entertained, but for us to leave here more determined to have the conversations, to do what is necessary, to do what Stephen Covey once said, is to seek first to understand and then to be understood. Because nobody have, has a monopoly on what is all good or all bad, that all of us are fallible. And to the extent that we want to lift this country through making sure that special interests and big corporations and lobbyists that write legislation, that they don't have more speech than we have, than your neighbor has, is to make sure that we bind together Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Libertarian, No Party, Jew, Gentile, Buddhist, Muslim, and everybody in between. That is the only way that we can unrig a system that doesn't help any of us when it comes down to it. Another reason why our work is so important is because we have generations yet unborn depending on us to do what is right in our time. You know, and, and as we reflect on Black History Month this month, can I, can I say that? Can I give a shout out for Black History Month? And I've been thinking a lot about this from Martin Luther King Jr. Day, because really Black History Month starts on MLK Day to now. And one of the things that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was able to do, him and his contemporaries, was to fight against a system. But Dr. King said this, and I want you to hold on to this. He said that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And he said hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And love is fierce. I want you to understand that love is fierce. Love is powerful. It is because of the love of this country that we are assembled here tonight together, regardless of political affiliation, to say that we are going to do everything in our power to make sure that we level the playing field, that everybody in this country should have equal speech and voice in a representative democracy. That is love. It is because of love that those of us who believe one way and those of us who believe another way, the fact that we are willing to stand up and give voice, and this is not about throwing away what you believe. 
But it is about not talking about folks, not tearing down folks. I believe that we should be hard on the issues and soft on people. How about that? <laughs> that it is unacceptable to tear folks down just because they believe differently from us. This is a nation of choice. So it's a choice to decide what candidate you want to vote for. It's bigger than just reproductive choice. It is choice of consciousness. In the United States of America, we believe in that. And why then does that choice stop when we have to deal with somebody who doesn't agree with us? Think about that. And if anybody in this room, and I'm not talking to the folks in this room, I know it's other folks, it's not folks in New Orleans, but it's other folks who tear folks down on social media just because they don't believe the same way. And people think it's okay, grown folks think, think, believe that it's okay to bully folks on social media while we lecture our kids not to bully folks. It is not okay. And any elected official, any leader in the United States of America, whether it's the White House, the Congress, the Governor's Mansion, the City Council, or the dog catcher who benefits from dividing us, they don't deserve our vote and they don't deserve our support. Because the only way that we rise is we rise together. And again, that doesn't mean that we always have to agree, but it means that we will seek first to understand and then to be understood. And that is why my 7.30 a.m. phone calls with my conservative Republican brother means a lot to me. And there is no political party affiliation that will separate our love for one another. And I'm hoping that you will take that with you there are so many good people in this country who voted a certain way that we might not agree with, but we don't have a right to call them basement dwellers. We don't have a right to call them deplorable. We don't have a right to look down our noses at them. We don't have a right to think that our belief system is better than theirs. We don't have that right in the United States of America. We are bigger than that. We are better than that. We are stronger than that. We are fierce. And so I want us all to check ourselves and look at the women and the men in the mirror. And if you have engaged in those activities before you came to Unrig, I hope you leave this place better. And I know it's hard because people will take you there. I know it is. But I want you to remember that love is fierce. Love is strong. Disagreement. We can disagree without tearing each other down. And some politicians benefit from that. They want to separate us, but we cannot allow them to do that. So everything that you love, whether you have children, you have a spouse, you have a neighbor, if you care about the environment, if you care about income and wealth inequality, if you care about college debt, no matter what you care about, all of those things are connected to the fact that in the United States of America, money can be used to bribe politicians. They are moved, some of them, not all of them, but far too many of them by their owners. I'm sorry, I meant donors. But there is no force on this earth that is more powerful than a committed, conscious-minded people willing to rise. And that is what Unrigged is about. It's not about Democrat. It's not about Republican. It is about a consciousness that says that I care, that I am my sisters and my brother's keeper. It is about a consciousness that decides that what happens to the least of these happens to all of us. It is about a consciousness that understands that although we elect people to office, we give them our power, that that power belongs to us and we have the power to take it back from them if they don't want to rock and roll the way that we want them to rock and roll in terms of lifting people in this country. It is time out for foolishness. There's a transcendence, can you feel it, that is happening all over this country. I will say even the world and it's happening because of people like you and you and you and you and you 
when even some folks who are not in this room with us this evening, but we must keep pushing. We must protest, but we also must plan. But ultimately, we must persevere. Because what this summit is about is the spark in you, that willingness, that when you go back home, no matter where you're from, whether it's Florida or Ohio or Texas or Kansas or Oregon, no matter where you are from, that you will take what you have learned today, the people that you have met today, that you will take that energy and that synergy back with you because love is the fiercest of them all. Love stands up. Love speaks up. And that is our charge. And you know what, sisters and brothers, I will confess something. This is going to be a heavy mountain to surmount. And we are working for something that we hope and believe that we will see in our lifetime. But even if we never see it in our lifetime, the fact that we are fighting for it, that is what legacy building is all about. To leave the world, the space, the place better than how you found it. That it is not necessarily about how you benefit, but how generations yet unborn benefit. And what will they say about us in 2018? Did we let partisan politics stop us from seeking understanding or did we love? Did we stand up for what was right and demand of politicians that you take the people's money one person at a time, not one big corporation, not just one wealthy donor, so that you have to answer to the people? And guess what, sisters and brothers, if they don't want to do that, then maybe they ought not be elected. I mean, it's simple. This is easy, and it's up to us together collectively when we agree and when we disagree. But what we agree with tonight is that we are committed to unrig the system. Love is the fiercest of them all. It really is. And in the moments when you are feeling like this just might not happen, I'm going to bring you word by three people before I leave this stage tonight. My first one is President Nelson Mandela when he said, it always seems impossible until it is done. And I'm also feeling tonight a little Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. I want you to come with me on this. You know, I went to Austin, Texas, sisters and brothers. And when I got there and I got the baggage claim, this is magnificent statue of the Congresswoman. And I walked over there and I was communing with that statue. I know some folks thought a sister lost her mind, but I was feeling something. <laughs> I was feeling all types of ways. But the Congresswoman, she said this. She said, what the people want is simple. They want an America as good as its promise. With people all over this country from all walks of life, no matter if they're rural, urban, suburban, what they want is an America as good as its promise. The way we get that is to make sure that we unrig the system. And my last messenger is closer to home. My beloved grandmother who was born in 1913, she could not read or write, but sisters, and this is for the sisters, sisters, she could count her money. <laughs> and she kept her money in the Southern Ladies Bank and Trust with a handkerchief. <laughs> if y'all don't know where that bank account is, you better ask somebody. <laughs> when I asked my grandmother, what does it take to be successful in life? She said, my dear granddaughter, all you need are the three bones. The wishbone, the jawbone, and the back. She said the wishbone will keep you hoping and praying because hope, 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 hope is the motivator, but the dream is the driver. The reason why we do what we do each and every day is because we hope and we believe that tomorrow will be better than today. She said the jawbone will give you courage to speak truth to power, to lift your voice, to not be silent, but to believe in the power and the purpose of your mission. Lift your voice. But the most important bone of them all, the super catcher, fragilistic, expialidocious bone, 
is the backbone. Because the backbone will keep you standing through all of your trials and your tribulations. And in this life, sisters and brothers, we will go through some stuff. But we cannot have a testimony without a test. And we are being tested whether or not we have courage and conviction enough and faith enough and love enough and dedication enough to do what we know is right in our time. We will, we must, we can unrig this system for ourselves and generations yet unborn so they will shout us out and say that in the 21st century in the early part of the 21st century they did that who are the they republicans did that democrats did that green party did that libertarians did that no party did that the american people did that can i get an amen amen, amen. And amen. Are you committed to unrigging the system? Are you committed to unrigging the system? We will do this in love, but we will do this. God bless you. Thank you, Senator Turner. Yeah, I'm barefoot. Thank you to Preservation All-Stars, Honey Honey, Ali Blake, Tig Notaro, Nikki Glazer, Adam Yenser. Thank you to all of tonight's speakers. To our producing sponsor, Triptych Studios. To our sponsors, CAA and Annapurna Pictures and Preservation Hall. Thank you all and everyone who joined us at home. Oh, they're live stream. Now I get it. Okay. It has been such an honor to be here with you guys tonight. Here's to taking back our democracy and unrigging the system together. One more time, give it up for Preservation All-Stars, Honey Honey and Ali Blake to take us home. Shine. Shine. Good 
know we're having lovely weather. So we're gonna all swing out together. Well, the saints go marching in. Thank you.